Hey, listeners, happy Saturday. Today is Caroline Herschel's birthday, so this seems like the perfect time to share our episode about her from 2014. Caroline Herschel is recognized as the first woman to discover a comet, which we talk about in this episode. But we also wanted to take just a moment to recognize another woman, Maria Kirsch, also known as Maria Winkleman, who discovered a comet in 1702. And that was decades before Herschel's first comet discovery. But she's uh, not often named as the first woman to discover a comet, both because her husband initially took the credit for it and because two other male astronomers had made the same discovery just a few hours before in Rome. So happy birthday, Caroline Herschel, and happy Saturday, everybody. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Uh, And today is for me a woo astronomy day because I love astronomy. Uh, I love talking about space and all things astronomical. So it's a a special in my wheelhouse one. But also uh, we're talking about a woman astronomer who really managed to break the barrier of women in scientific fields way earlier than you might anticipate, uh, in part because she was working alongside her brother and that sort of gave her entree into the to the world of science and astronomy. And in equal measure, though, it was due to her really steadfast dedication to her work. She was a very no-nonsense woman and completely focused. Uh, and as a consequence, she achieved a great deal. So we are talking about uh, Caroline Lucretia Herschel, who was born on March 16th of 1750, and she was born in Hanover, Germany. Uh, Her parents were Anna Ilse Moritzen and Isaac Herschel. And when Caroline was born, the Herschels were already in their 18th year of marriage, so they had already had a a pretty large family. They ended up having a total of 10 children, and Caroline was the eighth of them, although four of their children did not live past early childhood. And according to family records, the Herschel family line had actually come from Moravia, uh, where they left due to their Protestant beliefs and ended up settling in Saxony. Isaac was a musician and he played in a military regiment. He educated his sons in music whenever he was home. And it was during these lessons that Caroline's older brother, William, started to show some natural gifts for music. He was not only musically talented, but he was also extremely smart and very quick to learn in other areas of study also. Yeah, and one thing I feel like I should point out, uh, I didn't include it in the notes when I say that he was Isaac was able to educate his children when he was home. Being a military musician in this context is not uh, as much of an easy ride as you may think. <laughs> These men had to travel with the troops. They were in the trenches with the troops. They they were really a part of a functioning, active military. It wasn't like they just showed up to play. Uh, trumpet before things happened. So he really was traveling a lot. And uh, while William was urged into a musical career because of his natural proclivity that exhibited itself very early on, Caroline really felt when she looked back at their childhood, uh, and she mentions it in her memoirs and in letters, that if he had been allowed to pursue other interests other than music, his genius in astronomy really would have been revealed much earlier. And in her memoir, she mentions that while uh, her father Isaac was indeed devoted to music, he too was also interested in the stars. And here's a quick excerpt from uh, one of her memories from childhood. She says, My father was a great admirer of astronomy and had some knowledge of that science. For I remember his taking me on a clear frosty night into the street to make me acquainted with several of the most beautiful constellations after we had been gazing at a comet which was then visible. And I well remember with what delight he used to assist my brother William in his various contrivances in the pursuit of his philosophical studies, among which was a neatly turned four-inch globe upon which the equator and ecliptic were engraved by my brother. Caroline was also very attached to her brother William, who was 12 years older than she was from the time she was really very young. Yeah, she speaks of him so lovingly and with great adoration, uh, in her memoirs, it's uh, it's easy for me to identify with because my siblings are all much older than me, and I look at them, in so, particularly my oldest sister, almost as a parent figure. And it's a very similar relationship that she had with William, especially because Isaac traveled so much. Uh, and while Isaac wanted his children to learn music and French and philosophy, 
uh, particularly all of his children, his wife, uh, Anna, had a really much more strict and sensible path in mind for Caroline. Uh, When she was quite young, it became Caroline's job to knit all of the socks and stockings for her brothers. And as the male siblings of the family pursued their musical careers, Caroline learned how to care for a home. She really did not get the benefit of kind of the more philosophical education. In 1761, Caroline got a really severe typhus fever and it nearly killed her. Even after she got better, it took a really long time for her to regain her strength. And she recounted having to crawl up and down stairs on all fours for months because she was too weak to walk up and down them. Uh, So this illness also pretty significantly stunted Caroline's growth. She was extremely diminutive. uh, Even when she was in her adulthood and not growing anymore, she was less than five feet tall. Uh, And, you know, it left her not particularly pleasing to the eye in their opinion. And so her parents sort of came to this conclusion that she was never really going to have any marriage prospects. And so she should hope for a career as a scullery maid. Like that, that was, they were trying to be very practical. It sounds really rough. Uh, for a parent to do, particularly in to the modern era where, you know, children are encouraged to really follow their dreams and pursue their heart's desires. Um, but in this instance, this meant that Caroline's mother, Anna, basically doubled down on her insistence that her daughter really needed to stick to learning useful skills and leave the life of the mind to her brothers. In the early 1760s, Caroline's brother, William, traveled to England to pursue work as a music teacher and organist after he deserted his position with the Hanoverian guards. Even while he spent time in various towns traveling far away, people, his, the family was really hoping that he would come back to Hanover to settle down. And he did make an appearance back in Germany in 1764, but it was really more than anything else just to tell the family that he was not coming back uh, to live. He was moving to England permanently. And Caroline's memoir details this as a time of joyful reunion, but also sadness that she was too busy with scullery work uh, and with her first communion to really see him. And this bittersweet knowledge that they all shared that it would likely be quite some time before anyone in the family was going to see him again. And in this particular part of her memoir, she is really extremely clear and does not hide the fact that he is her very favorite brother. She calls him her dearest brother. So when William left, and uh, as we mentioned, it conflicted with her first communion, she was really heartbroken that her goodbye was cut short. And so she wrote this about his departure. Its effect on my shattered nerves I will not attempt to describe, nor what I felt for days and weeks after. I wish it were possible to say what I wish to say without feeling anew that feverish wretchedness which accompanied my walk in the afternoon with some of my school companions in my black silk dress and bouquet of artificial flowers, the same which had served my sister on her bridal day. I could think of nothing that on my return I should find nobody but my disconsolate father and mother. So sad. Uh, She really just adored her brother, and, you know, he was like a ray of sunshine when he came home, and knowing that he was gone really broke her heart. And... The following August, their father Isaac had a seizure, which left his right side almost entirely paralyzed. And so his inability to play or teach music at the level that he once had, which had been his great joy, and the various problems several of his children were having in their lives. You know, again, Caroline was one of many, and there were a number of struggles happening in the family. And the fact that he had kind of, as a consequence of being a uh, left with this paralysis, he couldn't do this thing that they had been doing, which was teaching Caroline on the sly from her mother. Uh, You know, when her mother was not around, he would secretly be like, come on, I'll teach you a little bit of music. Uh, And they just couldn't pull that off anymore with his infirm state. And all of this sort of conspired to leave this once boisterous man really quite depressed and suffering in his final several years. Uh, He ended up dying on March 22nd of 1767. While her father's attempts to offer her instruction were cut short, Caroline did get some lessons from the daughter of a family who lived in the same house as the Herschels when she was a teenager. Her friend died of consumption, which shut yet another door for education for Caroline. uh, And she just really abhorred the thought of life as a maid. She really, really wanted intellectual and creative stimulation. So she was trying to figure out how she could get a slightly higher position like that of a governess, 
quote, where the want of a knowledge of French would be no objection. Yeah, she knew she was not stupid and that she was fairly bright, but that she hadn't had all the educational opportunities that would really prepare her for a a much better position than a maid. But she was just trying to think sort of practically about, okay, what could I do that's better than this? Uh, And she did at one point manage to convince her mother and her brothers uh, after her father had died that she should be sent for a short time to a school to learn millinery and sewing. And she describes this as a very happy time, although her brothers were very clear that they were sending her just so she could make things for herself, that this was not going to be a professional um, stepping stone at all. Once she returned home, however, from this short time away where she was learning new things and meeting new people, she really just fell back into the same patterns of, you know, constant chores and schedule and drudgery that she so despised. That changed when the family got a letter from William in the fall of 1771. In this letter, he proposed that Caroline come to live with him and serve as his housekeeper and also as a singer to accompany him in concerts. He proposed a two-year trial and said that if it didn't work out, he would send her back. And Caroline was so super excited by this prospect that even uh, before it was all approved by her mother and the rest of the family, she started to practice singing in secret um, so that uh, William had actually asked another of their brothers who was musically skilled to tutor her, but there were some sibling skirmishes that really made that fall apart. Uh, Her brother kind of made fun of her, and she didn't like it, so she just practiced on her own. And she also, just in trying to lay the groundwork so that they would have no excuse to keep her, she knitted enough socks and stockings so the whole family would be covered for at least two years. She was really trying to make it as easy as possible to make her case to go. In the end, when William went to Germany to get Caroline, he also gave their mother a small annuity, which she could use to hire some help to replace Caroline's work around the house. Yeah, I mean, they were in effect losing a maid as well. So I feel like I should note that while Caroline hated this idea of being a maid and this life that her mother had planned for her, she did not seem to hate her mother. Um, She, When she talks in her journals about leaving Hanover, she refers to her her mother as her dear mother and, you know, the difficulty of leaving her. So uh, she hated the ideas that her mother had. She did not relish the plans that had been made on her behalf, but she really didn't seem to hold them as a, a negative against her relationship with her mother particularly. So Caroline and William set out for England together. And in Caroline's uh, memoirs, she describes this trip at great length and with lots of details. And she talks about all the stages of the journey and all the trials and discomfort that they often encountered because travel was extremely difficult. Um, William's journal, on the other hand, just says, August 16th, 1772, set off on my return to England in company with my sister. That just cracked me up when I found it in her uh, in her memoir. It was it's so funny. So uh, once Caroline and William got to England, Caroline did indeed learn to sing, and she developed her soprano voice so she could accompany her organist brother in performances. She also took two or three lessons a day from her brother because remember at this point he was a pretty successful music teacher. But that was not the only thing that William was up to in Bath while he was successful in music. He'd already turned his interest to science. He had astronomy students as well as music students, and he had been writing scientific papers for the Bath Philosophical Society. Uh, There's part of me that wonders if this is not why he was like, I'm never coming back to Germany. (laughs) Like he knew he would be kind of locked into the music career there, and he had already started to toy with this really significant career change. And Caroline arrived in the midst of William kind of making this transition in his life. And so for her, going from a life of repetition and predictability and menial duties to one of assisting her whirlwind brother was a huge change for this woman, who was only 22 at the time. So she was suddenly responsible for the budget of the household and taking care of trips to the market. And she performed with her brother as a featured singer often. And she apparently also had a lot of arguments with her brother's hired servant. She does not speak very well of that woman in her letters or her memoirs. She was also initially pretty homesick. 
Her English wasn't good enough to bond with anyone else in Bath, and her brother was incredibly busy. Her sister had been left a widow with six children, and Caroline also felt badly that there wasn't anything she could do to help. But on the upside, you know, while she is in this whirlwind, crazy world, the learning that she had yearned for back in Germany but had been denied was certainly abundant in England. She was mentally stimulated at all times. Uh, She had to learn the bookkeeping, as we were saying. She was learning English as quickly as she could. Uh, And she had to learn a lot more about music in pretty short order. And in some ways, this isolation of this transition and her homesickness really likely bonded her to William more than ever, although she really didn't get as much of his time and attention as she wished because he had so many students to see in addition to his extracurricular studies in astronomy. She was making a really good name for herself as a singer, though. She was even approached by other music companies to perform with them. But she declined, saying that she really needed to stay with her brother and his work. And as William turned his attention progressively more and more to astronomy, Caroline followed suit. Uh, She assisted her brother in the assembling of telescopes and analyzing the heavens. And we could do a whole podcast just about William and sort of how his music to astronomy transition happened. So I don't want people to think I'm just leaving that out, but Caroline's really the focus here. But while she's doing all of this and helping him assemble things and polishing lenses and mirrors, she ended up learning a great deal about astronomy herself. William is credited with discovering Uranus in 1781 while he was actually searching for double stars. Incidentally, the planet was initially named George, or the Georgian star, after the King of England, which sounds a lot more majestic than just calling a star George. Uh, (laughs) As a return for his work, William Herschel was knighted and appointed to the position of court astronomer for King George III. And this new appointment meant that the Herschels had to move closer to Windsor Castle. And while he was making less money as the royal astronomer than he had as a musician and teacher, uh, William Herschel was now making enough that he didn't have to kind of have this double career situation so he could focus entirely on his scientific endeavors. And William used this new position to build a bigger telescope, and he launched a long-term survey of the sky that would turn into a project that really ran two decades. And initially, as he would observe heavenly bodies through his telescope, he was up on this ladder and he would call them out to Caroline, who would be down on the ground, and she would carefully record everything that he said. So he really trusted her to keep track of everything that they were uh, witnessing and identifying. As their list got bigger and became more detailed, it took on the name New General Catalog. This name persists in codified form today, as the many astronomical objects are still identified by their NGC number. And William also gave Caroline her own, uh, what he called her, quote, seven-foot Newtonian sweeper. And this was a telescope that she would often use to observe the night sky uh, just on her own or when she was filling in for William while he was traveling so that they wouldn't have any gaps in their project. On February 26, 1783, she identified an open cluster, which is on the record as NGC 2360. The same year, she observed and recorded NGC 253, also known as the Sculptor Galaxy. And one of her claims to fame is that she was the first woman credited with discovering a comet. So on August 1st, and again on following nights of 1786, she saw an object that was moving across the night sky, and she identified it as a comet, and she immediately sent word by mail to all of uh, their fellow astronomers about her discovery in the hopes that they too would study it. She wanted to share this information as rapidly as possible. After the comet discovery, William, who was the king's astronomer, lobbied for his assistant, Caroline, to be paid for her work. This made her the first woman to actually be paid as a professional scientist in Great Britain. And she would go on to discover a total of eight comets uh, in a little longer than the decade following that first comet identification. And this was all happening during a sort of comet craze that was happening in post-Enlightenment Georgian England. So it gave Caroline a certain degree of celebrity, although as a woman astronomer, which was, you know, certainly an odd duck for the times, she was sometimes lampooned in comics, just as she was also being lauded as something of a visionary. 
1786, William started courting a wealthy widow neighbor, Mary Bernie Pitt. When, uh, when William married her in 1788, his partnership with Caroline changed really considerably and became somewhat strained. Uh, the household duties that Caroline had been taking care of all of this time were passed to William's bride, and the sister was then freed up to pursue her astronomy work full-time. And this certainly sounds like a good thing. She was pr- likely much more passionate about the astronomy, but the loss of control and her sense of place in her brother's life really affected Caroline quite deeply. After 16 years living and working with William, Caroline moved to her own lodgings and she started having to go to his place to work. She no longer had keys to the home or to the observatory. And we actually don't know exactly what Caroline's feelings were at this time. There is actually a 10-year gap in her personal journals from 1788 to 1798. Those documents were destroyed. There are journals with ripped out pages. Um... When her personal notes and narratives start up again near the end of the century, she speaks of her sister-in-law, who by all accounts was a really gentle and amiable woman. Everyone really liked her uh, with a great deal of kindness. And the two did eventually become very close. But I think it was a rough ride for those 10 years. She probably wrote some things down she did not want to be kept on record. Those 10 years were still spent working both with her brother and on her own. And this was when Caroline was discovering her many comets and she was keeping records of her work. The seven comets, which followed the first, were observed and identified in December 1788, January 1790, April 1790, December 1791, October 1792, November 1795, and August 1797. And the first royal astronomer of England, who was named John Flamsteed, had compiled an existing star catalog in the late 1600s and early 1700s. And so in addition to using this new free time that Caroline had at her disposal after her brother's marriage to search for comets, she also uh, used it to cross-index the Flamsteed catalog with the data that she and William had compiled. And she was able to add more than 500 additional stars to the existing record as a consequence. William died in 1822, and after her brother was gone, Caroline went back to Germany, where she continued her work entirely on her own. So on her own after William's death, and also working with her nephew, who was also an astronomer, Caroline cataloged nebulae. Along with her brother, Caroline was instrumental in expanding the number of known star clusters from 100 to 2,500. And those are rough numbers. It's, you know, more than that. But she went on to get many, many accolades uh, as she aged. She won a gold medal from the Royal Astronomical Society in 1828 for her work in nebulae. In 1832, the King of Denmark honored her with a medal for her work. She was made an honorary member of the Royal Society in 1835, and she actually shared the honor of being the first woman to be named an honorary member of the Society with Mary Somerville, who also worked in astronomy, and she was uh, also given this honorary membership the same year. In 1838, she was made a member of the Royal Irish Academy. In 1846, she was given the Gold Medal for Science by the King of Prussia. Caroline wrote her last entry in her daybook in September of 1845. And in the winter of 1847-1848, Caroline became ill uh, as the cold of the season swept in. She initially refused a neighbor friend's offer to move to her bed to a warmer room than it existed in. And she was already an elderly woman and somewhat frail at this point. And as a consequence of, you know, staying in this cold with a compromised immune system already, she just got sicker and sicker. She did eventually allow them to move her bed, and while she rallied now and again, she never really recovered. Her spirit remained until the end, though, and in a letter from the same bed-moving friend to Caroline's nephew John, it's reported that when a male friend sent his love in hopes that Caroline would soon be well enough for him to visit and give her a kiss as he had on her previous birthday, she replied by saying, Tell the general that I have not tasted anything I liked so well. I just love that she kind of was a little flirty even at the very end. It was very sweet. Uh, And the letter in which that story was relayed to John was dated January 6th of 1848. 
And Caroline died just three days later on January 9th. She was 97 at the time. A letter written by Caroline's niece to a cousin reads, I felt almost a sense of joyful relief at the death of my aunt and the thought that now the unquiet heart was at rest. All that she had of love to give was concentrated on her beloved brother. At his death, she felt herself alone. And Caroline wrote her own tombstone inscription, and it reads, The eyes of her who is glorified here below turn to the starry heavens. She had very pragmatically made all of the arrangements for her burial uh, and her funeral years before her death. So when she passed, it was basically like, nope, everything's taken care of already uh, because she didn't want to burden her nephew or any of her other relatives with dealing with it. She also wrote, I am nothing, I have nothing. All I am, all I know, I owe to my brother. I am only the tool which he shaped to his use. A well-trained puppy dog would have done as much. So some people interpret this as devotion to a sibling and others have read it, read it almost as resentful. The words of a woman who's bound by obligation to do this uh, because her brother was her benefactor and told her to. But given her obvious love for astronomy and the work they did together, it seems more in line with the thinking of someone who wishes to brush away praise and credit and instead focus the spotlight on someone else. Yeah, she seemed generally uncomfortable with kind of talking about herself in any sort of personal way or, you know, with accolades. She was always very quick to kind of shrug them off. Uh, there's a really lovely intro written in her memoir and about her, and it says, Her own recollections go back to the great earthquake of Lisbon. She lived through the American War, the old French Revolution, the rise and fall of Napoleon, and all manner of lesser events and wars. She saw all the improvements and inventions from the lumbering post wagon in which she made her first journey from Hanover to the railroads and electric telegraphs which have intersected all Europe, for she lived well down into the reign of Victoria. But her work of minding the heavens with her brother engrossed all her thoughts, and she scarcely mentions any public event. Several comets are named after her, including 35P Herschel Rigolet as is lunar crater C. Herschel, and an asteroid called Lucretia, which is her middle name. Uh, one of William's telescopes is on display at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, and another is on display at Cambridge, and there are several other pieces of telescopes um, at various uh, observatories and museums throughout the world. The Herschel Museum of Astronomy now stands at 19 New King Street in Bath, and that is where William and Caroline live together. And I would love to go visit. So, Tracy, let's do that. Okay. So, yeah, that uh, it's such an interesting story because she really, uh, she's often called the Cinderella of astronomy uh, because she started in this sort of scullery-made path and then ended up being really a luminary in her field. Uh, especially bizarre when you consider that on top of the fact that she was a woman at a time when men were really running the show in terms of science. I love it so much. Thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday. If you have heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of today's episode, since it is from the archive, that might be out of date now. You can email us at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com and you can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 